All right. Um, is it possible for us to adjust the title on the YouTube channel to have the full Castilla page? I'm not sure if we can do it at this point. Okay. Can it be done later? Yes. Is it possible for us to adjust it? Yes. Yeah, because um, so so just said she couldn't find it because she was looking for the full thing, and I saw that the others have the full thing as well. Um, I wasn't aware we were still able to talk, so I'm just checking if you're hearing me. We are. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> hush hush. <laughs> For one All right, it's six o'clock, so can we, can I go ahead and start?
Welcome one and all to the ninth Castilla Page lecture. It's our distinguished lecture series. That was the UWI song, University of the West Indies. We hope that you do feel a sense of nostalgia and love for the Caribbean after hearing it and seeing different snippets from the UWI campuses. At this time, I'm just going to continue telling you more about why we are so excited to have you with us. And this is, as I said, the ninth Castile LePage Distinguished Lecture. This annual Castile LePage Distinguished Lecture is organized by the Jamaican Language Unit. This is a unit in the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy at the Mona Campus of the University of the West Indies. The Castile LePage Distinguished Lecture Series honors the work and memory of two notable linguists, Frederick Cassidy and Robert LePage. In addition to their individual scholarship on Caribbean languages, together they gave us the Dictionary of Jamaican English, first published in 1967, and then the second edition was released in 1980. So the lecture stage itself has been graced by distinguished international scholars, such as Professor John R. Rickford of Stanford University, who did the inaugural lecture, Professor Carolyn Cooper of UWI Mona, Professor John McWhorter of Columbia University, and most recently, Professor Anna Dumod from University of Cape Town in South Africa. This evening, we're adding another brilliant scholar to this distinguished lineup, uh, Professor Dr. Christian Mayer from University of Freiburg. I now invite Dr. Vivette Milson White to welcome us. Dr. Milson White's main area of teaching and research is rhetoric and academic literacies. She is a senior lecturer and has been serving as head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy since August, 2021. Handing over to you, Dr. Milson White. Thank you, Dr. Cumberbatch, distinguished guests, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the University of the West Indies, the UWI Mona, Professor Sylvia Coinberg, colleagues from the various campuses of the UWI and from other universities and countries, students in Jamaica and elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, good evening to you. As the current head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy, I am honored to welcome you to this, the ninth Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture, being hosted in recognition of the work of two pioneers in the study of Caribbean languages and in celebration of International Creole Day that comes up tomorrow. The Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture Series is a testament to the spirit of academic collaboration and the unending quest for knowledge. The lecture has consistently brought us, as you've heard, outstanding speakers who have shared their wisdom and insights based on rigorous research and sound reasoning. In that spirit, I extend a special welcome to past presenters in this Cassidy LePage lecture series as well as the former coordinators of the Jamaican Language Unit, JLU, and I express my profound gratitude to the organizing committee for this year's lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy is indeed delighted to have all of you join us in this virtual space that allows us to transcend physical boundaries and to continue to appreciate our interconnected world. Transcending the confines of physical places and spaces and considering interconnections are particularly pertinent postures in the realm of linguistics, a discipline that helps us to understand and appreciate the intricacies of the verbal form of human communication, language. This evening, we'll have the benefit of thinking a little more and a little more critically about language and our world, because we have the privilege of the presence of Professor Christian Mayer, who will address us on English lexifier pigeons slash creoles, a word languages perspective. I extend an extra special hearty welcome to Professor Mayer. Given Professor Mayer's extensive body of work, his dedication to linguistic research, 
and his commitment to fostering cross-cultural understanding, we can anticipate a lecture that will broaden our understanding of what we may call linguistic phenomena, pidgins and creoles whose vocabulary is largely from English, as well as encourage us to ponder the power of language to reflect and shape our world. And I look forward to the engaging post-lecture discussion as well. So welcome again, Professor Mayor. Welcome again, esteemed guests. Welcome everyone in this virtual space to the ninth Cassidy LePage Distinguished Lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Milson White, for your warm welcome to all of us. At this time, we will be hearing from Professor Sylvia Kornberg. Professor Sylvia Kornberg is Professor of Linguistics and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. She's also a former head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy and one of the world's leading scholars in Creole linguistics, having done work on Burby's Dutch Creole, Papiamentu and Jamaican. Over to you, Prof. Cohen -Bird. Thank you so much, Karen. And are you able to hear me clearly? You can. Okay, great. I, I have so many reasons to be um, thrilled to be here today. Um, one reason is, of course, that we are honoring some great names in um, the history of the field, Frederick Cassidy and Robert LePage. Um, who, when I started uh, my own career in queer linguistics, I was still able to meet, which was fantastic. Uh, the other is that, um, as you point out, I'm not only dean of faculty, but also former head of department uh, within which a Jamaica language unit resides and a, and a linguist. Um, and this particular topic that is uh, going to be addressed today is one that um, is, uh, I think, very important and um, very um, dear to uh, anyone who's interested in uh, language in Jamaica. Um, and what I would uh, say to this is that from a Jamaican perspective, because Jamaica has such a large cultural footprint in the world, it is easy to think of Jamaican Creole as being, you know, the one and only Creole language um, that matters. While at the same time, um, of course, because of its lack of official status, it is a language that does not matter. So there is this huge ambiguity in the status of Jamaican Creole, and it is great to get a bigger perspective um and who best who better to present a bigger perspective than christian meyer um who um is able to uh, place this uh, particular conundrum in in this uh, you know perspective of uh, english lexified pigeons and grills uh, globally around the world so as dean of the faculty um i say welcome to all i see that the number of people watching now on youtube is steadily growing. This looks like a lecture that is going to be well supported by colleagues, uh, by past presenters, as you pointed out, by students and staff. Um, and so welcome as Dean of Faculty and um, my, uh, uh, as I said, I, I personally look forward to enjoying this lecture um, as, as a linguist. Back to you, Karen. Thank you, Dean Kornberg, for greeting all of us on behalf of the faculty and for enlightening us about the link between language and culture and how we represent ourselves in the world. At this time, I'm going to hand over to Karen Nelson. Ms. Nelson is a postgraduate student doing research in applied linguistics, and she will be introducing us to this very distinguished Professor Christian Meyer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kompabach. Professor Sylvia Kallenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, 
Dr. Vivet Milson White, head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy. Dr. Karen Cumberbatch, acting coordinator of the Jamaican Language Unit. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. In a career spanning more than 30 years, Professor Christian Meyer was associate professor in the Department of English at the University of Innsbruck, Austria, before being appointed chair in English linguistics at the University of Freiburg, Germany. His general research focus has been corpus-based description of modern English grammar and variability and change in standard Englishes worldwide. His current research focuses on the role of global English in a multilingual world, multilingual and non-standard language practices in computer-mediated communication, and the sociolinguistics of diaspora and migration, where he's advocating for the use of corpora and digital tools to complement existing approaches. His many achievements include publication of more than 10 monographs and edited collections, and more than 150 book chapters and journal articles, several of which deal with aspects of Jamaican Creole and Nigerian Pidgin. He has, over several years, been an active collaborator with the UWI Mono, as well as other campuses of the UWI. This collaboration has included research, but has also extended to student exchange. In addition, the Jamaican component of the International Corpus of, Eng Corpus of English, ICE, was compiled by Professor Meyer in collaboration with Professor Hubert Devonish and other colleagues from UWI Mono. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Christian Meyer. Please help me to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. And just to point out to everyone, as eager as we are to hear from Prof, please note that there will be a question and answer segment after the lecture. If you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat at any point during the lecture and they will be passed on to him for his response after his presentation. Over to you, Prof Meyer. Um, Dean Cowanberg, um, Dr. Milson White, uh, dear colleagues and friends, thank you very much for this gracious invitation. You have pointed out our joint history of cooperation. You've pointed out the great line of speakers, which this opportunity allows me to join. And without further ado, and hoping that technology will not let us down, I will share my screen. And uh, set the scene. Uh, there are two views of the relation between English Devexifier and its various uh, Creole relative sisters. There is the bilingual view. There is Jamaican English versus a separate language. Call it Patois, call it dialect, call it Creole. And the two are jostling for space and recognition in the community. There are two integrated views, one which is plainly wrong. And the other one, which I um, support in this presentation, the wrong one is printed in red. It sees Jamaican Creole or Patois as a dialect variety or subordinate form of English. That is not the way I want to relate it to its lexifier. For me, there is um, a um, cover language Jamaican, which comprises uh, English specifically in its Jamaican form and Creole or Patois making up a Jamaican linguistic repertoire. And on this basis, I will now have a look at English, the world's lingua franca, the global language, and Patois Jamaican Creole as a world language. So let me take you to Phnom Penh in Cambodia and to a travel book written by Pico Ayer, who wrote about his 1999 visit 
wander off the main streets and you are in a maze of little lanes, completely unlit and unpaved, where a former Zen monk runs a guest house and Africans on the run live by teaching English. I would like to remind you that this was Cambodia recovering from strife and a bitter war, genocide, and uh, the streets, the city was being rebuilt. And nevertheless, the locals felt a need to learn and study English, in this case, being taught to them by Africans. Now you go to Cambodia today, you go to Thailand, you go to Southeast Asia, and you will see that um, a relative of English, Jamaican Creole, um, has also globalized, and uh, that there are um, reggae events, that there are performers. I've never heard about them. Probably you haven't heard about them either, but they carry the language of Jamaica to the far corners of the world. You can also get evidence of this from British literature, in particular, multicultural British fiction of the late 20th and 21st centuries. For example, an author such as uh, Zadie Smith reminds us that when you go to Gambia, you will not just hear Gambian English and local indigenous African languages, you will hear the whole Anglosphere compressed or projected through this lens of Gambia. The British aid worker meets a local and starts wondering about his accent. You sound American, I said to myself, the narrator. Um, but, but that was only one thread of the rich tapestry of his voice. Many different movies and adverts were in there, and a lot of hip-hop, Esmeralda, As the World Turns, the BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, and some of the reggae that you heard all over the city from every taxi, every market store, hairdresser, an old yellow man tune was playing right now from the tinny speakers above our heads. Now, I'm obviously not the first to treat Jamaican language, Patois, as uh, a globally relevant um, way of speaking. A very early pioneer is Velma Pollard, who wrote uh, a book on the language of Rastafari, which I think came out in the 90s and then revised it for a second edition in 2000. And the main difference was that the second edition, unlike the first one, had a chapter on the globalization of dread talk. Uh, more recently, I would like to pay homage to Hubert Devonish and Karen Carpenter, their book, Language, Race, and the Global Jamaican. What they are investigating is definitely far from what I'm going to be looking at. But nevertheless, the concern with the relation between the global and the local is uh, a shared interest. Personally, I am grateful to many famous Jamaican, Caribbean, and West African literary writers and musicians that have brought their pigeons and creoles to the attention of the world, including Germany. Um, and last but not least, uh, since my work on CMC, computer mediated, uh, communication was mentioned, the millions of anonymous speakers and writers supporting a massive grassroots pigeon and creole writing boom on the world wide web. Now, before I go to the place of uh, Patois, Jamaican Creole in the scheme of things, let me introduce you to a frame of reference that has helped me a lot in understanding the role of English in a multilingual world, whether it's a post-colonial sphere in this multilingual world, or whether it's a non-colonial sphere like continental Europe and the country I'm based in, Germany. This one is not a linguist, so he's not concerned with phonemes, uh, grammatical constructions, um, sociolinguistic variation as much as uh, power. And he sees the multilingual world as a rigidly stratified hierarchical constellation of languages in which one is clearly at the top and this is standard English. This is not just for English speakers or Creole speakers, this is for the whole world. English is the hub of a multilingual world. 
On level two below that, there are less than 20 super central languages, such as um, other European ex-colonial languages or major non-European languages, such as Hindi, Mandarin, Turkish, Arabic, that clearly have transnational importance. Below that, there are 200 what he calls central languages, languages like Cambodian, Dutch, Romanian, and Danish that are firmly institutionalized and have overt prestige on the national scale in the national home basis, but quite frankly are of little interest um, beyond that, which means that the vast majority of languages is assembled at the bottom of the pile, 6,000 plus at least. They have no presence in the media. They have little cultural cachet. They have sometimes very small communities of speakers in terms of demographic numbers. And many of them are endangered and may not uh, survive uh, the 21st century. So this one points out that this is a surprisingly efficient, strongly ordered hierarchical network that binds together directly or indirectly the 6.5 billion inhabitants of the earth at the global level, which is what he wrote in 2010. And today you would have to make this 8 billion inhabitants. This does not mean that the world will ever be a monolingual English speaking place. What it means is that wherever you go, you will find someone who probably can translate from your language into, uh, you can translate into English. Uh, they understand your English and can, trans can translate you into, uh, for you into the local languages. Now, uh, Sylvia Cohenberg mentioned institutionalization, political recognition, official status, institutional support of that kind. As we know, most Pidgin and Creole languages unfortunately do not enjoy this support and would hence automatically end up at the bottom tier, the peripheral languages in the multilingual world. Now, my question will be, is Jamaican Creole a small language with global dispersion, either in a migrant diaspora or culturally, and an extremely high media profile? Can this be a peripheral language? My tentative answer is I'd rather, I'd rather not give it that status. Take a sister variety, in some ways, Nigerian pidgin. Can a language that has, according to Ethnologue, more than 100 million speakers, most of them second language and lingua franca users, and the global dispersion, be a peripheral language in today's world? I don't think so. So the question that I'll be addressing will be, how far up in this one system can Creole and Pidgin languages make it? I've given a provisional answer in an adaptation of this one's idea to world Englishes, the global English language complex. And I would say there's an uncontested uh, hub, standard American English, British audiences usually don't like to hear me um, say this, uh, but it's the truth at the beginning of the 21st century. If you walk the streets of Germany and if you find English uh, phrases, English words on shops, then usually it's the American spellings that uh, shop owners opt for and not the British ones. Um, you hardly hear, you hardly ever hear of uh, American movies being subtitled for English speaking audiences elsewhere, but you hear a lot about uh, Scottish movies being subtitled for American audiences. So there is a hierarchy and we're no longer living in a bipolar post-colonial um, Anglosphere in which British and American English function as uh, equipollent standards. So you go down below and I would argue that non-standard English can play transnationally important roles. And Jamaican, Creole, Nigerian, Pidgin would be African American English would be examples in my view. You have L2 varieties like Nigerian or Indian English that are clearly 
uh, relevant beyond the national home basis. And last but not least, you have um, the category of speaker, English as a lingua franca user that, I'm repre uh, that I represent. And there is air airline English, which is clearly transnationally, if not globally relevant, and spoken in many accents, native and uh, non-native. And as you go down, uh, this is also evidently true at lower levels. So this is the idea that I will attempt to illustrate. I've just summarized this slide already. We'll move on. And I will add a caveat, a rider. The pluricentric global English language complex and the world language system as described by this one, have lots of linguistic variation, but they are not uh, happy democracies of voices. They are, and this is World English, a surprisingly efficient, strongly ordered hierarchical networks tying together, in the case of English, around 2 billion habitual users, foreign language, second language, um, lingua franca users, native speakers at the global level. The communicative global market for English is not free or fair, but it provides often unexpected niches for non-standard and stigmatized varieties, as I shall, so, shall, shall, shall show. Sorry. Um, I will approach my topic through a number of case studies. The first one is a simple lexicographical enterprise, the OED started as a lexicographical enterprise at the height of the colonial imperial era in the 19th century, has been decolonizing for some time. Question of uh, whether the OED will ever be able to fully decolonize itself and uh, stop becoming an empire of words in whatever definition. And I've always found it inspiring and very interesting to look at the last printed edition in 1991, the original edition plus the various supp supplements integrated into the last print edition, and Jamaica hardly figured. 300 years of colonization didn't leave an imprint in the OED. The few words that you found represent the outsider's colonial anthropological perspective. You find Obia recorded in some, by some travel writer, and uh, you find references to folklore, and that was what you found in the printed OED. Uh, 40 years later, 30, 40 years later, you have the OED online, constantly being updated, and the Jamaican words and Jamaican senses of existing English words now I think number in the low thousands. So it's a massive uh, amount of lexical material which has been integrated into the OED. As you can see, the perspective is very much no longer the outsiders, but the insiders. You find Jamaican influences on the world English lexicon as represented in the OED. Um, directly from Jamaican Creole or mediated through uh, British Creole or multicultural London English. To an audience like you, I guess all these examples don't need a word of comment. Most recently, unfortunately for my presentation, there was another ad update which probably you as experts uh, are aware of and which the OED celebrates, for example, by putting on show Richard Alsop's um, um, uh, uh, books, uh, materials from Richard Alsop's desk. And I guess I say on the shoulders of giants, because this is the fruit that the work of uh, Frederick Cassidy, Robert Lee Page, and uh, Richard Alsop um, the fruit that their work has borne in terms of the OED, there's probably no other pidgin or creole variety of English that could be so easily incorporated into the OED's lexical database 
because of the work of dedicated scholars who provided um, the foundations. Again, you have a 2021 update, um, 74 entirely new entries. And the Caribbean standard English level is marginal and trivial. I don't mind Antiguan English, but Bahamian English, Barbadian English, and several other standard varieties of English getting their entry. But this is not really um, a very sensational addition to the OED. But look at all the other layers. You have Caribbean informal lexical material spread throughout the Caribbean, either the entire region or at least uh, a major part of it. You have specifically Jamaican or Trinidadian vocabulary. And again, I don't think that in this context uh, any comment is needed because you know these items. But do note that uh, grammatical material like Hafi gets an entry, which in the dictionary uh, is interesting, and that many Creole words are considered um, important enough for a lexicographic document documentation of uh, global English to be included. Now, I decided to compare Jamaican Creole with Nigerian Pidgin because they have sufficient similarities and shared history to make a comparison useful. And nevertheless, they are distinct in crucial ways. One I mentioned was demographic growth speaker numbers. Now, the OED wants to do its bit for Nigerian English, considering it probably the dominant African variety that needs uh, to be uh, included into a full record of uh, the English vocabulary in the 21st century. But unlike Jamaican English, there is hardly any previous professional and highly successful lexicographical work of the type I've um, mentioned for Nigerian English. And in spite of its 100 million plus speakers, the lexical harvest in comparison to Jamaican Creole is relatively limited. But you do note significant tendencies, which are partly similar. In the Nigerian English recent edition, January 2020, to the OED, you have relatively more standard and close to standard English. A word like barbing salon is probably not uh, Nigerian pidgin. Agric is definitely not. Gist is pidgin and has a long history in English. Uh, phrases like next, tomorrow, uh, in its special Nigerian use, um, Indigen are uh, slightly archaic, as is Ember Months. So this is a colonial bureaucrat's language um, casting its shadow. Interesting stuff, deserving of inclusion. But of course, what you also have is the insider perspective, the rich Nigerian page lexicon developed to refer to everyday urban life for Nigeria's poor. And uh, probably the one word that might need a gloss is Tukumbo, foreign, foreign stuff, Tukumbo car, a kind of um, informal term that speaks a lot about uh, ordinary speakers' perception of their place in the world with regard to former colonial powers and uh, possible destinations for emigration. The conceptual framework in which I have developed my specific kind of mobile, of, res of research on mobile Creoles is uh, basically a cultural anthropological one. The one scholar I've owed a lot to is Jan Blommert, the late Jan Blommert with his approach um, to new approach to the sociolinguistics of globalization. This one I mentioned, Apadurai has been very helpful by explaining cultural globalization in terms of five interrelated spaces or scapes, 
the technoscape, the hard wiring, the technology we need for computer mediated communication, uh, the ethnoscapes, the very shifting fluid movements of people in diasporic migrations, global media scapes, and then uh, the finance scape, of course, which underpins much of it and which I as a linguist uh, have little expertise to talk about, and uh, the idioscape. I've also profited from Castell's distinction between a world of places and a world of flows, his ideas on global and local connectedness. And they immediately make sense when instead of financial flows or flows of goods and people, you start thinking about flows of linguistic resources. Now, where do you find evidence on global Jamaican in the late 1970s to the 1990s, you could have studied an extraterritorial contact variety, London Jamaican or Black British uh, English or British Creole, as some people called it. It has now largely faded away. Um, some of it has fed into multicultural London English. There are similar Jamaican diasporas that have been studied. And what I have always been struck by is the intense connections, not just between the Caribbean and West Africa in terms of language, but also between Cari the Caribbean and other parts of Africa, South Africa, East Africa. Uh, if you want some particularly striking examples, you could go to Githiora's recent study of on Sheng that contains a very substantial list uh, of uh, Jamaicanisms in Sheng, the Kiswahili English urban vernacular of Nairobi, which is spreading fast. And he comments on Jamaica receiving the name Burning Spear decades ago, and uh, in the reverse uh, direction, um, many um, dread talk word, words are fully integrated grammatically in the Kiswahili Bantu system, like the plurals Mrasta Nati. In Nigerian Pidgin, you could argue that uh, it is just part of a dialect continuum which extends over the entire West African littoral zone. Unlike the relatively, if no longer absolutely solid post-colonial African language boundaries at the standard level between French, English, Portuguese, and a little Spanish in between. Uh, Nigerian pidgin, other West African pidgins uh, cross the Anglo-French divide relatively easily. And from Githiora's book on Sheng, I got this um, substantial list of areas in which Nigerian pidgin impacts um, offline, on life, everyday and cultural life in the East African metropolis of Nairobi. So pidgin travels with preachers, with Nollywood movies, which to some extent are also popular even in the Caribbean, I'm told. It travels with students, it travels with marginalized, uh, poor, undocumented migrants. Jamaican Creole, Nigerian Pidgin are, as we know, very ethno-linguistically vital in diasporic communities. And this is a feature they share with indigenous African lingua francas, uh, such as uh, urban Wolof or Lingala, as has been out, um, uh, out, uh, pointed out by Salikoko Mofoene on numerous occasions. And so this all builds up into a picture where you see that some of the peripheral languages that have no institutional support do establish themselves as languages with global relevance for large and diverse groups of people. One thing which I would briefly like to touch on is how the mobilization of Nigerian pidgin and the mobilization of Jamaican Creole 
have led to contacts and cross-fertilization that you would not have seen if the two varieties had remained stuck in their territorial historic home bases. Again, you do not need to do any more than just check an OED entry for a Jamaicanism. And in this particular case, I've taken the um, uh, discourse marker or, or discourse particle scene, which they define as expressing approval, assent or understanding. And they give a first uh, quotation from 1973. The outfit was dramatic for days. And when she came down King's House steps, you could hear the gasps of appreciation. So obviously, and as should be, should rightly be the case, the first attestation is from Jamaica. But then you see that all the other attestations already so, show the globalization of dread talk and its appropriation in various contexts. So you find Nigerian British writers using this expression. You find uh, expat uh, Jamaican writers or British Jamaican writers use it. And that illustrates how it spreads. And this is really an entry that directly supports Velma Pollard's analysis of two and a half decades ago. This is the same point, except uh, I would like to make it a little more concrete. Diran Adebayo is a British-born Nigerian-British um, novelist dealing with the contemporary London scene. And um, in this particular novel, Some Kind of Black, he deals with the travails of a South London uh, Afro-British bright youngster who gets a scholarship to Oxford. And he has to negotiate his, linguistically negotiate his life in or his way and path in complex ways, both in Oxford and in South London. And he confronts different linguistic challenges and difficulties in these two places. So this is South London and he daily couldn't get a fix on her background. The accent was mostly a familiar East London one, but with a tinge of somewhere else that he couldn't pinpoint. So that's what a writer refers to, uh, to or what a linguist would refer to as multicultural London English. The strangest thing was when she had talked about getting permission from her boss, she had pronounced ask Mr. Worms as ask the way Jamaicans did, very peculiar for an English girl. And here you think that we have come full circle and all the components that I want to tie together in this talk have fallen into place. I briefly mentioned Richard also, and his wonderful Dictionary of Caribbean English use, Usage. You would find an entry for arcs in the non-standard spelling. He would trace it back all the way to Old English on the basis of the OED as a dialect form, which has always very much been part of English wherever it has been spoken in its 1200 year history. Uh, people who are unaware, speakers are unaware of the history of their language, as we all know. Today, ARX indexes Afro-Caribbean identity in London because people have forgot or have no opportunity to listen to the traditional dialect English ARX anymore. And so putting, uh, I suppose I would say that um, it wouldn't have done the novelists or the commentators any harm to look at all sub's dictionary, and then they would have had a, a more comprehensive idea of the history, the complex history of ask and ax. Nigerian pidgin, Jamaican English, in, uh, Jamaican Creole in contact in the US is, a, is a stuff which I and people in my team published on extensively um, when it came to, or when it comes to social media English. Focusing on Africa, I've, I'm always struck by the, the creative ways in which Nigerian Pidgin and Jamaican Creole 
blend and merge in the work of Nigerian um, hip hop uh, artists. I lack any street credibility, as you can imagine, but um, this is really an explosion of linguistic creativity. I have one sound sample, which I've saved up for a little later, so you can listen to somebody mixing international informal English, perhaps American English, Nigerian Pidgin and Jamaican Creole. And since street culture has the potential to invigorate and strengthen high culture and elite cultural institutions in a diversifying post-colonial world are under pressure to do their bit. I have noted that there is a direct line of connection from grime, multicultural long, uh, London English, with its Jamaican input to the stage of London's National Theatre. And I want to give you this as a site where the currents, which I've mentioned separately, come together impressively. Skepta is one of the musicians whose songs are in the stage directions of Inua Elams, a Nigerian British uh, dramatist, play the Barbershop Chronicles. And you will see why this play is fascinating for a linguist studying pigeons, creoles, and world Englishes. All the world's a stage or a barbershop in this play. So you see that there is a complex story. There are transnational families, and Lagos and Accra are connected to London, and London is connected back to Kampala, so it all makes sense. You see, have a look at the many scenes. And you will see what type of language converges on stage in the Brit in London's National Theatre. In scene four, in other scenes, you've got Winston, a Caribbean character, because obviously no picture of world English in London would be complete without uh, Caribbean speakers. So this is to just to give you a feel. This is a short extract. We are leaving Accra and we, oh, sorry. We are leaving Accra and shifting to London. You missed the spot. Where? There. Where? Over there near Emmanuel's chair. Now we can sweep it himself. My man who come this morning. Who was that? What? At the door. Oh, uh, no one. He just wants to sell some clippers. That early. Why am I asking for Emmanuel? Who? Am I asking for Chief Director? Look, I don't know. Why are you so bothered? You have to hold your tongue in front of strangers, you know. Hmm? Just now. You never got that far before. Look, I don't know what you're on about, okay? Yo! Are you ready for me? So, uh, Nigerian English would have been uh, the next variety coming along. So I've summarized the situation. Uh, there is not unity of place in this play, but there is definitely unity of time because in every single barbershop, the scene ends with people turning to the TV screen where a fictitious Champions League final is playing. And so you see that um, this is the underlying bracket that holds everything together. Now, since um, I'm broadcasting from Germany, so to speak, 
I would have like I I would like to give you a few specimens of linguistic landscaping. This is um, an Afro white Caribbean restaurant. Uh, the spelling is original, as you can see, and they do quite a few things with language. For example, you have um, licking finger spot. And I don't think if you learn standard English in school, you will get uh, the full uh, potential cultural and linguistic uh, subtext here. Uh, chop today, come tomorrow. I guess uh, German English as a foreign language uh, uh, variety would be insufficient. Uh, there is radical language uh, mixing and grassroots, grassroots multilingualism. Soup, Ofe, Mit, Fufu manages to roll uh, four different languages into a four-word utterance. And the Afro Fleisch special is, is something absolutely weird because it compounds the meaning of English special, special offer with uh, um, German Spezial, which doesn't have this meaning. So um, I guess the owner wants to be as inclusive as possible, attractive to as many audiences as possible, works largely successfully in this kind of multilingual way. We, my team and I have conducted lots of interviews with Africans who recently arrived in the Freiburg area and in uh, the rural area in uh, central western Germany in order to find out about their approach to lingua franca communication. Our working hypothesis has been borne out as correct. There are three lingua francas in competition, incipient German, of course, the local language, then what English they bring with them, and then Nigerian pidgin, which uh, survives. And uh, Jamaican, in spite of the absence of any Jamaicans, shows its presence again and again, particularly in interviews with Gambians. I haven't got the answer, but Zadie Smith also noted it in the quotation I gave from her novel. Uh, Patois, also Gambians like Patois and American language also, they can do slangs like, you know what I'm saying, Jamaicans, they don't care, you know, uh, Wata, 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 Guan, uh, they say, and so on. And so you see that the participants are co-constructing what they think Jamaicans say, finally they are successful. What is going on? Wagwan, Odeso, and the, the Odeso is a German discourse marker which uh, comes in. This is Sharon Dodua Otu, award-winning novelist writing in German. Her most famous novel to date is Adas Raum, which has recently been translated into English. She came to Germany as a young woman, set herself up in multicultural and multilingual Berlin, but unlike other English-speaking expats, she didn't continue to live her life in English, as many of them do. She decided to make an effort and become a German writer, thus radically restricting her international reputation and audience. But uh, the gamble played out well for her. And as you can see, uh, whenever she writes about Africans in Germany, you have German as a narrative text. But the German reader is treated to a few discourse, uh, pidgin English uh, sentence final discourse markers all, to um, uh, idiophones from pidgin, to wote, that means let's go, in ga, I think, a, Ghana, uh, a language from Ghana, and of course to English as the world language. So there is multicultural literature in German laced with English, African languages, and pidgin, and the reader is given some help, but not much. Now, since my time is almost up, I will refer you to a recent article in World Englishes about informal non-standard epicenters in the global Anglescape, where I uh, try to work, elaborate the point that um, among the non-standard Creole and English dialects um, that um, have super central status. The three I mentioned are the most impressive ones. 
I give a list of criteria which they fulfill to uneven extent, but in the end, they all have the same global status. And so I would say to summarize all this and simplifying a bit, you could say African-American English has become globalized almost exclusively through media alone with relatively little physical migration of African-Americans to the places from Germany via Korea, Japan to Mongolia, where African-American English uh, plays some role. With Nigeria, it has so far been dominantly migration, but the media influence, uh, the cultural cachet is building up. And with Jamaica, the, the media, physical migration and media and culture aspects are in a good balance. What I would conclude with is really the future, and the future for Creole languages, like any other languages in the world, is tied up with technology. I did a little experiment yesterday. Please translate, asking chat GPT, please translate the following text into Saramaccan, as the discussion has shown, that's from the written version of my talk. Saramaccan cannot be described without taking its transnational dimension into account, which is of course wrong. I want, I, I, in the original I wrote Jamaican. Its spread and expansion are promoted by economic and cultural factors that are increasingly removing the colonial stigma still attaching to it. This is why I refer to it as an informal world language. Now, Chad GPT responded in the following way, giving me correct information, largely correct information about Saramaka, and then pointing out that since there are, since uh, it's not institutionalized and has no uh, standard orthography, text could not be generated. Now, before I show you the last slide. I'll give you a few seconds to think. Kick Saramakan out, put the correct word Jamaican Creole in, and ask yourself what will Chat GPT do? Chat GPT must have had enough training data in order to have a go at generating. And I'm not going to make a fool of myself reading Jamaican Creole from the page, but I fully concur with the conclusion that make me call it an informal world language, which is where I or to stop. And I thank you all for your attention. And I will be more than happy to learn from your comments or respond to any question that you may have. Thank you so much, Prof, for your enlightening talk. We do have questions coming in for you, so we'll begin to share them with you. Uh, oh, the really? first one is, what variety of English is considered lingua franca when English changes on contact with other languages in pronunciation, et cetera? And the fact that varieties of English around the world feature code mixing. I think you will never, you have one variety which dominates among the natively spoken varieties and therefore has a massive influence. It uh, will be attractive for other speakers of other varieties to imitate. As my last slide showed, English. most training data in the most training data in the new language generating technologies are biased towards standard American English and therefore reproduces it. But English, uh, there is no single accent. Uh, think of CNN, think of Al Jazeera. There needs to, in lingua franca communication, the big thing is not identity, but successful communication. As long as the accent doesn't uh, hinder mutual communication among the participants, Communication will flow 
and all actions are legitimate. You probably shouldn't reduce your grammar. You shouldn't reduce your grammar and vocabulary below a certain level because then cognitive constraints would kick in and you wouldn't be able to fully express what you what you want to express. Um, so I I would say. As a lingua franca, English belongs to no one. And I would expect native speakers of English, especially those belonging to the to two largest groups, to perhaps consider that the lingua franca role of English would require them to accommodate to the two billion, let's say if you, if, uh, uh, subtract the native speakers from the 2 billion. You have 1.6 billion uh, speakers of English that uh, do not speak the language natively, that have trouble with culturally specific metaphors such as America's baseball metaphors or uh, Britain and the Commonwealth's cricket metaphors. And uh, so I would say it's not about identity when you have lingua franca and so more flexibility, more variability is to be expected and should be tolerated. There is not the one good lingua franca variety that you can teach worldwide. That's probably the, the short answer <laughs> to a very important question. Thank you. Uh, another question. Isn't the Oxford English Dictionary coming very late to the party and also coming to the wrong party? I am asking this because the OED is now including Jamaican Creole words in a dictionary of English at a point in time when lots of people see Jamaican Creole as separate from English. Uh, that's the dreaded question, which I tried to push into the background in <laughs> at the very beginning. Um, yes, uh, the standard sociolinguistic way to answer this question is a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, which emphasizes uh, official uh, recognition, institutional support. It doesn't help to answer this particular question because among the world's 6,000 languages, there are many that have no army and navy and whose status as a language no one would deny. And by the same logic, everybody uh, has a right to point out that uh, if you look at the structure and the separate history, Creoles uh, and Nigerian pidgin are languages in their own right, and no doubt about that. I would, as a non-native speaking linguist who is not a Creole speaker himself, I don't think I'm competent to answer the question. I can only point out that speakers who use pigeons and Creoles alongside English very often um, opt for a kind of uh, integrative view, as I call it at the beginning, they see themselves as speaking a different, a very different specific language, which is closely tied up with their personal and cultural identity, and nevertheless being part of a larger community of English speakers. And can I say that such native speakers are wrong? And closer to the topic I have dealt with today, what about the many people who speak Jamaican Creole coming from other backgrounds or borrow from Jamaican Creole? And I guess the OED's excuse is to say that these words are borrowed into English because they are used in texts which are otherwise in English, which probably you would say contain elements from another language, Creole. And people all over the world know about these words. And some Jamaican words are borrowed into German in certain communities of practice uh, 
uh, among, especially among young people, and people are interested in Jamaican music and culture. So the words travel. The words you 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 read you read these Jamaican words that the OED includes in newspapers that are otherwise one hundred percent written in English, and nobody would claim that they are written in another language. So it's it's borrowing. Um, it's. I, I suppose it's it's some kind of recognition. A people having this interest, people finding Jamaica's linguistic resources attractive. You can of course trivialize and expropriate the linguistic resources. I'm fully aware of that. You can borrow to mock speakers, but uh, I see much of the traffic from Jamaica into other varieties of English, not just restricted to Africa or West Africa, where there's a lot of shared history. There is some kind of genuine intercultural exchange expressed through language, and not all of it is negative. And so the OED is, I think it has a point. Uh, I like the OED. As a, foreign, as, as a as as a as a non English speaker studying variation in English and related languages, if you want to find this label for pigeons and creoles, I find the boring old printed OED that ended in 1989 um, a bad thing in comparison to the much more lively online OED, which gives you both perspectives. The old OED was very much marked by the outsider colonial travel writer administrator perspective. Whatever is strange, exotic, you make a record and you put this vocabulary, this piece, uh, this lexical item into a dictionary. And the new one, I think, is a resource for the study of the impact of Jamaican culture on world English and by implication on other English speaking societies. It's not always uh, unproblematical. The OED defining its own agenda of decolonization is not ideal, but I would say in the Caribbean case, there was cooperation and partnership with people like Richard Alsop. Um, and I guess that is, if you, co if you cooperate with local experts, local linguists, local cultural activists, as they to some extent do, I would say you're on the right track. I know that this answer will not satisfy uh, for every, everybody in my audience, but I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Um, from Alison Irvin, Jamaican cultural product like hip hop arguably has identification with resistance going way back. Could this be part of the reason for its global success, comparing with something like Trinidad Soka? Um, I. I guess there is a point where you have to admit your ignorance. Uh, <laughs> my personal and probably naive explanation was has always been that um, Jamaica, in a very fragmented and heterogeneous region where you don't have heavyweights like Nigeria with its 240 million people, 100 million of whom speak Nigerian pidgin. You have smaller communities, but among these smaller communities, Jamaica has a long history, many consistent developments, migration out of Jamaica. Trinidad has a shorter history. English, English, Creole, Creolized English emerged through the 19th century. The population is smaller. 
um, there is less direct continuity because of subsequent Indian input. Um, I think being being the big being the biggest community with a very long history, probably more consistent consistently relating back to Africa than in other and and, and England at the same time or, or Britain, less interference from other factors. That the, I, I would I would have looked for explanation, but uh, that doesn't speak to your specific question about soca and uh, hip hop. There are experts other than me who would probably be, be able to speak to the details. All right. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, where do you think British Creole falls into this talk of Creoles and pigeons? Is it a separate Creole or would it be considered a continuation of Jamaican Creole or some amalgamation of Caribbean Creole? Um, I think uh, my classification would be heritage language. And ha heritage languages arise in diaspora, in migrant uh, diasporas. Some of them are not vital at all. Uh, if people sort of blend in the, the mainstream quickly and easily uh, in two, maximally three generations, the heritage language will fade away. There is some fading away in British Creole, typical of the heritage language thing. And I think the crucial thing about British Creole is that we now know that it was a temporary phenomenon because it did not, it, it, it didn't become the British equivalent of African American English, a variety that was passed on from generation to generation learned natively, because very soon British Creole speakers were dominant in the local variety of British English and added, Creole, uh, added British Creole as an additional code. And I think this is where you probably should go from first wave sociolinguistics uh, and its focus on the vernacular to a second and third wave approach where you talk about ethnolinguistic repertoires. So I would say as a heritage language, increasingly young people used it to switch on and off uh, in, in, in basically group boundary negotiating practices. They, could, they had an extra code that they could switch on in order to signal that uh, certain people were excluded, they could switch it off again. And so I, I like the repertoire approach better than the basic traditional approach in dialectology, which focuses on vernaculars in close knit communities. And as, as we now know, it, it was a temporary phenomenon extending from the 1970s to around the early 90s, and then uh, the the new thing was multicultural London English. Okay. Uh, do you think it is now time for Jamaican Creole to become a standardized variety and would this solidify its status as an informal leading variety or would it subtract from its popularity and fascination? Ultimately, would it even matter at all? I think... Jamaican Creole is so vital that uh, I think it would have little impact. Some people argue that in the Nigerian discussion, it has actually been actively argued that attempts to regulate and standardize Nigerian pidgin would hamper its free growth and spread and flexibility because it would introduce complications which otherwise wouldn't exist. I, uh, a few years ago, I think it was the 100th birthday 
of Miss Lou. I was asked to sign a petition for Jamaican Creole to be recognized as an official language. I consulted with some people who are members of the audience today, whether because I felt silly, because I didn't feel that I had any right to pontificate on this matter. And um, they said, well, there's no harm in somebody from outside of Jamaica who's not even an English speaker supporting this, because I have a, as a dialect speaker myself, I have a strong investment in dialect and I don't want dialect to be discriminated against. And I think dialect thrives in a social environment where its speakers are not discriminated against. And perhaps this is some analogy which may strike you as surprising. Next door to me in Switzerland, they have a diagnostic situation, Swiss German and standard German, which has been stable for hundreds of years almost. It's never been a problem because there is no stigmatization. People accept the dialect. It's a strong symbol of Swiss national identity among, among German speakers. And they have a Swiss accented national variety of standard German, which they use for practical purposes communication with the wider German speaking world. And I guess Swiss German, by the way, is not standardized, but not stigmatized. It's not threatened. It's the default language for communication among Swiss German speakers at all levels of formality. And if you can achieve recognition of a dialect without standardization, I think the question whether you should break you should break away from a larger community of speakers is a matter of practical expediency. In, in history, you have Dutch breaking away from the larger German-speaking area. Uh, uh, Sylvia Kohenberg will probably know the chronology. Let's say five hundred years ago, Dutch being standardized, then Afrikaans, Cape Dutch broke away from Dutch, was standardized as a language. The Swiss never decided to go that way. And I think it's, it's a complicated, the, the chief thing is that stigmatization, marginalization, discrimination against dialect speakers in definable social areas is the problem. Whether Jamaicans I suppose it's really not for me to, to, to recommend an educational policy and a language political strategy for Jamaica in the 21st century. As a linguist, I know that a bilingual program teaching a standardized form of Creole plus English as a second language is feasible. It can be done if there is support from above and support from below. And I know that JLU has a strong stand on it, and it, this is intellectually consistent. It's entirely legitimate. And in the democratic process, this issue should be settled by Jamaicans. And a country that is blessed with you, it doesn't need foreign experts when it comes to language planning. <laughs> OK. Yes, that's how we feel. We're happy to have so many language scientists born and bred in the CARICOM region. All right, we have two more questions at least. Um, of the three varieties, oh, hold. yes, of the three varieties, AAVE, Jamaican Creole, and Nigerian Pigeon, which do you think will be around in 2090 and why? Uh, they, 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 all three of them will be around. Uh, if the world goes on more or less uh, the normal way with only minor disasters, uh, why should Jamaican Creole go away within 80 years? The alternative would be Jamaicans uh, shedding their Creole heritage 
speaking some kind of uh, accented Caribbean English, full dialect death. This has happened in other parts of the English speaking world, but I don't see the signs of it. Uh, Decreolization was a fear 50 years ago. And uh, if people who know more about that than I do can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if you now use the preverbal uh, perfect marker did instead of the older ones, N O N, then I, that is not decreolization, that is Creole developing. So Nigerian pidgin has been booming at fantastic rates. The only way to eliminate Nigerian pidgin would probably be to reorganize the country in such a way that every child has a chance to go to a good school and be taught their indigenous languages and English as an official language because Pidgin thrives in the informal economy. It, th it thrives in the, 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 the booming populous extremely large cities of the country. People don't have an easy life in these places, but you could say pidgin is, is the language which makes Nigeria work or where things work in Nigeria. Very often it's pidgin that's the language used. And why should African-American English disappear? Um, all, all, all three will develop. And the, the question between now and 2090 is probably much less traditional language planning, but think about my last two slides, the impact of technology. Why is it that African-American can be easily generated? Nigerian pidgin can be generated by an artificial intelligence because there's, tra there's training data around. And I would say there will be a time when we don't produce text only, but we have machines speak and write for us and then edit the output. And so I was surprised actually that a run of the mill thing, which was trained on mainstream English data was able to generate, I mean, you, of course, you, you spotted, uh, I, I didn't have the time to go through the chat GPT generated uh, Jamaican Creole, but it wasn't all wrong. It was, I would say, got chat GPT got it right more often than he got it wrong. So a bright future for all three of them, I would say. Great. Languages of the formerly colonized continue to survive. Uh, the last question is actually about the chat GPT bit. <laughs> um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we all play around, don't we? Uh, some of us are blown away by the patois produced by chat GPT. It is a pity it wasn't trained on the Cassidy JLU writing system, though. Um, do you think this can influence word processing software creators like Microsoft for Microsoft Word to include Creole dictionaries in the software? And would you agree that this can help Patwa to become a central language? I think the, the folks who do the language development, they are full of talk about anti-biasing. Um, they Google, Google the Google machine translation department uh, puts out a constant stream of papers on how, how much needs to be done about under-resourced languages. And I think for Nigerian Pidgin, there is actually currently an initiative that aims to provide corpus resources for exactly that kind of purpose. And I think if you push, if, if you push the idea with Google hard enough, they would find a lot of marketing potential. So that I, I would expect little resistance. And the problem would, of course, be that Chat GPT and machine translation rely on the output that's out there. So the Cassidy LePage orthography would become fruitful the moment enough people take it up 
and uh, voluntarily provide the data for future text generation. So in, in, in a period of, let's say, 10, 15 years, you would still get the chaka chaka spelling. <laughs> Uh, am I not allowed to say that? You are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my famous, my, my much more famous predecessors in this role as Cassidy the page speaker, I think popularized this. But yeah, uh, why not use the opportunity? Because I think the, the, the moment is a favorable one. And I'm surprised, I was surprised that the issue of under-resourced languages figured prominently in the Google Language Research Department. All right. We have another question from Annie Paul. It, is there an advantage to converting oral languages to scribal ones? Uh, sorry. Uh, is there an, an advantage to converting oral languages to scribal ones? Status upgrade, I would say. We're living in a world in which literacy is a requirement for upward social mobility, for economic success. And the world language system makes it pretty clear that languages which have no scribal system Need strong in order to survive, they need strong support from elsewhere. Let's say if the language has cultural, religious function, then probably it can survive without the, the, the support of a writing system. There is the argument that a that there's the, 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 the felicitous English expression, reduce the language to writing. And there's something to that. You have a spoken, lively, vibrant language. Then you reduce it to writing and standardize it. You homogenize it. I suppose that's a necessary price to pay. And in the debates about Nigerian pidgin, some people actually actively promote this argument that in the case of Nigerian pidgin, in the short term, you wouldn't gain anything. You would have to repair some of the serious problems in the educational institutions before it makes sense for pigeon to be standardized, is their argument. Thanks. Uh, we have another question coming in from Elizabeth Montoya Stemon. Uh, empowering Jamaicans to write Jamaican Creole will signify the recognition of a Jamaican Creole as language, true? Yes. Okay. Caribbean, true. Um, Caribbean literature has produced lots of pioneering works. You would have to Probably most Creole coexists with English. And here we come back to the bilingual. Uh, why not call, uh, I have a, a sort of weakness for the idea to call the, the combination of Creole and English Jamaican, because that is the typical repertoire. Uh, but of course, that's a cheap way of uh, avoiding the difficult question, but yes, uh, writing the language, even if it's in non-standardized spelling, adds usefulness, adds prestige, makes the language accessible to many more people. And sometimes, especially in diasporic contexts, like when we looked at the media, and the social media data, people said, I only use the written form. I actually didn't speak Creole. My parents didn't want me to, 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 to speak like that. But now with you guys on the web, teach me how to write it. And um, so that, that shows you that writing Creole 
can have separate value for people who haven't got full who are semi speakers. And you couldn't call somebody who writes pidgin in a diasporic context in order to communicate with fellow Jamaicans, fellow Nigerians. You wouldn't call this inauthentic communicatively. So there's a concern of ours that so many of our CARICOM citizens and in those in the diaspora have been deprived of their linguistic heritage. And it's something we continue to address. Okay, we're doing one last call for questions before we take a comment from Prof. Korenberg. Um, I the, have been deprived. Relatively speaking, I would say Creoles and Pigeons, or Nigerian Pigeon and Caribbean and uh, Jamaican Creole are more ethnolinguistically vital in the diaspora than, for example, uh, alternative languages. Uh, the African, uh, our research partners who we interviewed, they were very clear that Nigerian pidgin was what they could go on using in Germany, whereas um, other, other indigenous African languages, unless they belong to the big three, Nigeria, Hausa, uh, Yoruba, and Igbo, that they were not likely to be to be helpful, and uh, for them, uh, they uh, they had this idea that Nigerian pidgin was that part of their African linguistic heritage which they could carry on. So, I guess when you emigrate, your your linguistic heritage is always under threat. And relatively speaking, I would say in this competition. When you look at African migrants coming to Europe, it is the pigeons that they preserve longer than other languages they speak and have brought to Europe. Okay. Thanks for that insight. Uh, so we have one last question from the head of department, Dr. Milson White, and then right after her, uh, Prof. Korenberg can go ahead. Uh, so Dr. Milson White is asking a very specific question of you, and she has a linguist colleague in the UK, uh, Theresa Lillis, who always told her to read Blomet. I hope I'm not massacring that person's surname, um, B-L-O-M-M-A-E-R. -E yeah, Whenever she heard Dr. Milson White talking about teaching academic writing in the Caribbean sociolinguistic complex, and she said she hasn't gotten around to reading him yet, but she wanted to know if you can indicate how useful the work might be for Caribbean scholars. Um, it would tell them that what they take for granted in Creoles is actually part of a much wider phenomenon. And the quick, the shortest definition that Blomert gives of the sociolinguistics of globalization is that it's a um, sociolinguistics of mobile linguistic resources and not of static languages. So he would say the idea that uh, a language is a self-contained system and that monolingualism is an ide ideal and that, the, that one correct standard variety should be the best representation of this language is absurd in the modern world because to some extent all of us operate multi-dialectal multi-lingual repertoires we shift languages uh, we go to places where we can only use part of the language uh, the the linguistic inventory that we have but we have to add others and um, so th these th these ideas i uh, I think he would argue that uh, there is communication and communication requires linguistic resources and whether and, and uh, the person who does most of their communication work using just resources from one language and perhaps the standard variety is uh, an exception on the global scale. And, and these these are ideas which are familiar. These, uh, 
to any person with a Caribbean background um, from their own lived experience. Thanks. I think we all got some insight there. Uh, <laughs> My turn. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody tried so, to ask a question, but you go ahead, Sylvia. All right. So first of all, I see that the uh, online audience has been incredibly loyal, and oh. uh, which I think really says, um, Christian, if um, I may just uh, forego all the formalities, uh, which really says how much this topic speaks to the audience and um, how hungry people are to hear more on these matters. Um, uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment on the whole question of should people be uh, be learning the standard spe standardized spelling and whether or not that would kill the creativity. I think it would actually unleash the creativity because without it, people are really struggling to represent Jamaican Creole in a way that makes any sense at all. Um, you know, if you're trying to use the rules of English spelling to write a language mm -hmm. like Jamaican Creole, you're always going to be confined in a way. Um, I, it was great fun to see some examples from the Oxford English Dictionary online, but also to realize how much the Oxford English Dictionary uh, is behind the times because a word like a word like seen is no longer in common usage. I remember it well from the 1990s. Uh, but it certainly went out of style completely. Um, and one final uh, comment that I have has to do with the whole, um, uh, the phenomenon of bi-directional influence between the Caribbean and West Africa. Um, of course, when Paul Simon came out with his Graceland album, there was an expectation that this would somehow, you know, lift um, African music and take it to the world, and it did not because it only took Paul Simon's music to the world. Uh, West Africans and South Africans have done this entirely on their own. Um, their music uh, has now conquered uh, the world, and somebody like Burner Boy is incredibly popular here. Um, but the bi-directional influence, I think, suggests that we might be moving in the direction of a truly Atlantic Creole, um, or at least a community of young people um, who are so versed in each other's varieties that they may just come up with something like that. So I'm wondering if that's uh, in the works. What do you think? You're talking about the re-emergence of a Black Atlantic linguistic and cultural sphere in the digital age of the 21st century. All right. I think uh, I see traces of such a vision, except you couldn't keep it to the Black Atlantic because then Kenya would come in and... Uh, right, right, right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but in, I, I guess in a way it would no longer be Britain only. It would be a general, the whole of Europe in a way, because the Mediterranean, uh, as we've seen over the past few year, years, is, has become a bridge where people in difficult circumstances migrate to Europe in large numbers and uh, mm. they have not yet carved out a place for themselves culturally and linguistically. And yeah, but it's a new kind of connectivity. And I think it will, it's a mass phenomenon and that separates it from the early post-colonial migration back to Africa. Mm -hmm. And perhaps also from, uh, the Rastafarian ideal that uh, these were elite, relatively small groups of people. And it could be a bigger movement and uh, involving more people. And it's, it's the good side, it's connectivity is uh, a potential which you can use to good and bad ends. And I, if, if that came about, I think it would be interesting and good. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, quite remarkably, that last comment by Sylvia, which Prof Maya just responded to, is actually what the last question was <laughs> that somebody was squeezing <laughs> it's covering right on. So um, it, thank you so much for answering that last question. Uh, this has been a very stimulating evening. Thank you so much, Prof Maya, for engaging with us so thoroughly. Um, we know it's past midnight in Germany and we really appreciate all of the dialogue. You're answering all our questions and everything that you shared tonight with us. Um, the recording of this lecture, like the others before, it will remain on the Broadcast Jamaica on YouTube channel so that you can watch it again and again, yeah, yeah. as well as share it with friends. And we cannot end without thanking those people who have helped to make this event a success. And our vote of thanks will be done by Ms. Julia Jackson, a graduate student doing research on language related to Jamaican cuisine. So I'll hand over to Juliet Jackson at this time. Uh, on, Juliet, you need you to unmute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Komenbach. The privilege is mine to express gratitude to the following persons who made this evening's program a reality. Professor Christian Mayer for presenting quite an informative and a thought-provoking lecture. Professor Sylvia Cohenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education for bringing greetings. Dr. Vivek Milson White, head of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy for the welcome and for the continued support from the department in this event. Dr. Karen Cumberbash for emceeing the event and she's now acting as the head of the JLU and she was instrumental in the planning. Mrs. Susanna Campbell Blagrove, she's a senior administrative assistant in the JLU for her work behind the scenes on the administrative matters that are associated with an event such as this. Susanna and Mr. Donit Salmon, and they helped, well, they collaborated with student volunteers and they created the flyer. To Susanna for providing technical support and for monitoring the comments on YouTube and Zoom during the event. And I think Dr. Cohenberg has also assisted with that. To our audience on YouTube, we want to thank you. To the JLU volunteers who assisted with the promotion of the event. Indeed, this evening was quite an inspiration, and it was good for us to be here. And I would like to thank you all for your tremendous digital hospitality, your lively comments and stimulating questions. It was so, a mutual pleasure. Thank you so, so much again for sharing you your mind and your thoughts and we benefited greatly so everyone this brings us to the end of the ninth annual Cassidy LePage distinguished lecture we look forward to seeing you and others next year October the last Thursday of October in 2024 for the 10th lecture and I know that you'll be itching to hear more on Creoles before that. So on the 21st of February, you can join us for our celebration of International Mother Tongue Day, where we'll be celebrating English Creoles, such as Patois, and the French Lexified Creoles, Creoles that are found in CARICOM as well. So we look forward to your joining us on the 21st of February. Have a great night. Prof Maya, have a great morning. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd rather a few hours sleep, so don't worry. So, okay, thank you very much, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye.